So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me in this presentation. Uh, if you're online or in person, thanks for coming up. And yeah, today I'll be going over Milvis, our vector database, and its attempt to accelerate ANN searches on large-scale vector data sets. A little bit about myself. My name is Philip Haltmeyer, and I'm a data engineer at Zillas. And as a little background for Zillas, Zillas is a data company that was started in 2017, and at this point, we're 80 people strong. Zillas is the creator and the main contributor to the Milvis project. And here's my info. If you have any questions after, send me a message. And as a quick rundown of what the project has been through so far, so the idea started back in 2018. Um, we later open sourced it in 2019, joined the LF and AI, LF, AI and Data Foundation in 2020. And in 2021, we released our 1.0 and 2.0 version and also graduated from an incubation project to a graduate project in the LF, AI, and Data Foundation. So here are the contents for the talk today. First, I'll be going over the problems of unstructured data and what Milvis is trying to solve. Then I'll go through what is Milvis, where it fits into people's pipelines, and what features it offers. After this, I'll go over the architecture, a mid-level overview, not too complicated, and finally, some real-world use cases to see where it's being used and how cool the technology is. So first, let's go over the problem of unstructured data and why we need Milvis. So there are three types of data. There's unstructured data, structured data, and semi-structured data. With structured data, the data has a defined pattern and a solid structure and can fit in tabular places. So a good way to think of this is something that you might write into Excel, into an Excel document. So that's things like strings, numbers, and dates, things that can easily be compared to each other. Then there's unstructured data. Unstructured data accounts for roughly 80% of all the data that we are currently holding. It has no structure, and it's really hard for machines to understand. The things that fall into this case are things like audio, images, um, videos, language, stuff that needs some more processing to be done in order for machines to understand it. And lastly, there's semi-structured data. And for semi-structured data, it's kind of in between. A good example for this, I believe, is an email. All emails have a header, they have a subject, and they have a body, and maybe some attachments. So overall, there is a structure, but what's inside those areas is unstructured. So an email body will be just language, and machines will have a hard time understanding that. A few other ones are XMLs and JSONs. So why is unstructured data difficult? So the big reason is, with structured data, you can rely on traditional parsing methods and relational databases to store and search through your data. This can't really be done with unstructured data up until now. With the rise of deep learning um, methods and neural nets, we finally have the key to unlock the data and actually have it machine readable. So what this means is the process has turned from a figuring out what to do with these things to figuring out what kind of vector computations we have to do. And by vector computations, I mean because a neural net if you, the data you throw in will usually come out as a vector. And now I'll go over a little bit about vectors and how they're different from numbers. So numbers have the basic arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Um, they're easily comparable. They have pretty much three states. You can either be greater than, less than, or equal to. And this results in some really easy indexing methods. So one of the most common ones are B-trees. And for those of you who are not familiar with indexing, Indexing is a way to rewrite your data so that you can have quicker access speeds, usually at the cost of write operations and storage space. Vectors, on the other hand, don't really have these simple arithmetic operations. The main operation that you use with vectors are similarity calculations. And two of the main ones are the Euclidean distance, L2 norm, and cosine uh, distance, L1 norm. And these calculations can be a little bit difficult, and what results is that you don't really have a direct way of comparing these vectors. So that's where approximate nearest neighbor comes into play. And we can see two examples of this. So on the bottom left, we have clustering. And on the bottom right, we have graph-based. And these are just methods to be able to index these vectors, even though they can't be directly compared to each other. And I'll go a little bit more in details in the next slide. So these are the four main vector index types. So you have hash-based, which the main library is Falcone. And with Falcone and hashing in, uh, indexing, it's kind of the opposite of a regular hash. With a regular hash, you're aiming to minimize the amount of conflicts. And um, on the other hand, with locality-sensitive hashing, you want conflicts. You're maximizing it. So this is how indexing happens. So if you were to index your data, you would first run it through the hashing algorithm to get your buckets. 
And then when you're searching for something, another index, you would run it through uh, the hash and figure out which bucket's in to find the most similar results. The next type is tree-based. And for tree-based, we have Spotify's annoy algorithm. And the way to think about annoy is just it's a binary tree. So what you do with annoy is you take two random points and you create a hyperplane between the data. And this is your first uh, split in the tree. So you keep going down the line, selecting two random points on each side of the tree and creating another split until you get to the specified number. With annoy, you can specify how many, you want, how many leaves you want at the bottom. And this is useful because when you're searching, it just turns into running down the binary tree. So you take the first split, you look at the, um, the split, and you see on which side it falls, and then you just keep following that line until you get to the closest results at the bottom. And to speed things up and make things more accurate, since it's randomized at the start, you can create a forest of trees. And with that forest of trees, you can throw them into a priority queue, and your result with a pretty fast and reliable method of searching all this data. Next type is inverted file-based, and this is the most popular type. This is where Facebook's face library comes into play, and the way this work, works is it just works through clustering. So the key for every inverted file is the centroid of the data that you're storing. So, and the data in that inverted file is just the raw vectors that fall in that cluster. So when you go to search, you compare your search vector to the centroids. You find out which centroids are closest, and the next step is to just look through all the data in that inverted file. And this is a really good one because it allows for expanding data. With a few other ones, you kind of hit a limit at some point and you can't create any more um, index files. Or if you do index, it'll have to be a long process of creating a new one. With the inverted file base, you can just create some more inverted files. Next, we have the graph based, which is the main library's HMSW. And with this, you build a multi-layer graph where the top layers are pretty sparse and they get more dense as you go down. And the way this works when searching is you just look for the closest neighbor or the closest node on the top layer, you find it, and then you go down a layer. And then you keep doing that process, and as you go further and further down, the results will be closer and closer because it gets more dense. And this is a pretty cool way of searching uh, the vectors. So these are the four main types of index types. So what is Milvis and where does it come into play? So this is where I'll talk about what we offer and sort of how it fits in. This is a pretty standard um, ML data pipeline. For now, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, so we can sort of ignore the training part of the pipeline because Milvis doesn't really have much to do with it. What we'll look at is the production part of the pipeline. And there's three major steps before Milvis, and, or two major steps before Milvis, and those are, the first box is our data flow. So this is where we're inserting, or getting data into our pipeline, and the way you can think of this is, let's say a user uploads an image from their phone, or you're pulling data from the stock market, something like this. It's your unstructured data and it's coming into the system. Next, you have your model. So this is where you decide which kind of model you're going to be using for your data. Uh, images have convolutional neural nets, languages have transformers, and then there's some LTSMs for, like, let's say, stock market data, which is more for serial data and time-sensitive data. So after you throw your data through those models, you result with a, ve a vector. So this vector is what Milvis deals with and what we store. So you can insert it there into Milvis and store it and index it. So when you're performing, that's where this pipeline ends for inserting, uh, step three, Milvis. When you're searching, you pretty much take the first two as well. Your data comes in and you also encode your data. You need to be using the same encoder to get the same type of vectors and to have the same parameters for the vectors. Once you have your search vector, you throw it into Milvis and you perform a search. And this will, you can say how many results you want, how many things you want to search for, what uh, parameters you want for every type of indexing method has a different parameter. And with this, you get a result of the closest vectors. And from there, it is up to you to decide what you want to do. Some use, use cases want to rearrange the results. They want to reorder. They want to do some more stuff, some more post-processing. And after that, you give it to your customer. And then ultimately, based on their feedback, if it's similar, if it's good, that means that your encoder is working well. If not, you can take that feedback and kind of train your model up to do a little bit better. That's the general pipeline of where Milvis fits in with all these things. So now I'll go over some of the features that we support with Milvis. So first of all, it supports heterogeneous computing. So we support many x86 instruction sets, including SSE AVX2 and AVX512. We also support NVIDIA GPUs, and we're currently working on certain FPGAs and MLUs. And ARM processors, ARM processors are in the works, but they're taking a little bit of time. Secondly, we support many key database functions. 
So things like data partitioning, data sharding, um, supporting all the CRUD operations, so creating, reading, updating, and deleting, which you can't really be a database without those, and then also filtered queries and searches. Next, we also uh, provide top-of-the-line search performance based on those libraries that you saw before, so the uh, tree-based, the um, inverted file-based, and the graph-based, and a few other ones. And we implemented them and improved on them to kind of speed up our system. And lastly, we support many application development environments. We support Go, Java, C++, Python, and a RESTful API, and we're working on a few more. Next comes cloud nativity. So with 1.0, we designed it around only being locally run, and then we realized that a lot of people want to run it on the cloud, speed up things, kind of make it more reliable. But the issue was that we were um, working with using a shared storage system, which, as everyone knows, can bottleneck on a lot of search requests, and we really didn't like that. So with 2.0, we aim to be fully cloud native, and what we did is we made a Kubernetes native, and we are using Helm to deploy, and Helm allows for pretty easy deployment and changing up of the cluster, scaling up, scaling down, and a lot of other things. Um, we based our storage design on MinIO, and for those of you who don't know, MinIO is a way to kind of simulate uh, S3 on your local storage, which is really useful because it lets you kind of test out all your things, and MinIO also offers gateways for the other cloud services. So if you want to use Google uh, Azure's blob and uh, Google Cloud Storage, you just use this little gateway, and it can transform those requests to a native, um, their native API calls. We're going to work on kind of supporting everything natively. It's just S3 was the most used and the easiest to implement first. And lastly, it's easily scalable. We're highly elastic. We disaggregated the storage and the compute. So this allows you to kind of scale everything easily and have easy data recovery. And we also separated the read, writes, and background services. So now let's go over quickly like a mid-level architecture design. Um, you can get into a lot more detail, but I'm going to try to keep it sort of simple for now. But this is our Milvis general architecture. So the main idea is that we use a log as our backbone, which can be seen in the center in the uh, message storage. And the reason we use a log is because it lets you kind of split everything up and do this kind of disaggregated system. Before, we were using shared storage, and that didn't really work. Um, in addition to the log system, we designed a unique time schema, which allows for accepting unified stream data and batched insert data, which is really good because it allows for consistency across the system, even when you're streaming or batch inserting. And what you can see here is there's mainly four parts of the system. You have the access layer, you have the coordinator services, you have the um, workers, and then you also have the storage. And I'll go into all of these a little bit later. But the main idea is all of these layers are mutually independent, so that allows easy scaling and easy data recovery. So let's go over the access layer first. And before we do that, there are a few definitions we should probably go over, because I'm not sure who's familiar with database systems. So with databases, there are three main types of syntaxes or commands. So the first is data definition language requests. And what those are, they're commands to define and modify like your table schemas, the names, and what you're storing, and how your whole table looks like. This doesn't actually deal with the data you're inserting. It's just more to kind of create the system, the, the frame for the data. Then you have your data management language requests. These ones are the actual ones that are inserting data, that are storing it, modifying it, and retrieving the data. And then lastly, you have your data control language requests, and these are commands that define rights and permissions through the system, so more administrative things. So let's first start with the proxy node. So the proxy node is stateless fully, so it's easily scalable, and its crash recovery is pretty simple. And it's the user endpoint. So before it, you do have the Kubernetes just simple load balancer, but this is where everyone is accessing your system. And what the proxy does, it is pre-process some of the requests. So what this means is that it will check, let's say you're trying to create a table. Does that table already exist? If so, instead of going through the entire system, it can just throw out, like, you can't do that. Um, it will also tell you if you're inserting data and it doesn't fit the schema for the table. That means that, like, let's say your table is designed to store vectors of dimension 512 and you try to insert a 400-dimensional ve uh, vector, it will tell you right away that it's, it, it won't work. And that allows kind of speeding up things because it avoids wasting and going throughout the entire system and just throwing an error at the end. Um, so yeah, so all the uh, DDL and DCL requests are pointed to the coordinators and everything dealing with data, so the DML requests are pointed to the log, which is ultimately uh, used by the worker nodes. 
So next layer is the coordinator layer. Uh, these ones are not stateless, so these ones are a little bit important, and we're working on a way for making these very highly available and kind of fixing that all up. So the first most important one is the root co coordinator. So this guy is pretty much in charge of everything, and he handles all the DDL and DCL requests, and is also the time oracle. So we want to have one centralized time here, because we are working with timestamps for consistency. So he's in charge of that. Next, we have the data coordinator node. So it's involved in triggering all the background data operations. So things like flushing data to storage, things like compacting the data if it's very uh, uh, segmented, and stuff like that. So kind of these coordinators are in charge of the background applications that don't really have to do with you and how your system runs. It's more just keeping everything up and running smoothly. And what it also does, it, the data coordinator maintains the metadata of the inserted data. So this is pretty much things like how much data you're inserting, where it came from, stuff like this, some information that uh, you might need later. And it also manages the topology of the worker nodes, the data nodes. So this is just kind of controlling. It controls them, tells them where to look. It handles when they disconnect, reconnect, and those types of things. Next, we have the query coordinator. Uh, it coordinates all the searches and queries. Um, it manages load balancing for all the searches because the, server, uh, the worker nodes are stateless again. They don't know about anyone else, so it tells them how, what area segments to look at of your data and what to search through. And it also, again, manages the topology, which you'll see in all of them. They all manage the topology of their respective worker nodes. Lastly is index coordinator. Um, it's in charge of assigning index building to the index nodes. So each node needs to build an index on some part of the data. And that's the one in charge of telling where to, which data to, goes to which uh, worker node. And it also contains the index metadata. Every index, um, so like if you're using face, annoy, or one of these, they all have their own parameters. And these are important because it really changes how they work. And when you're searching, there's also different parameters for searching. So you need an area to store that data. And then um, also manages the topology of the index worker nodes. Next layer are the worker layer. This is, I would say, one of the most important layers. Uh, does all the work. So overall, they are the ones that handle all of the DML requests. So all the data mutation, all the inserts, all the deletes, all the updates. And they're all, again, stateless, so easily scalable. The data node is the one that deals with inserts, mainly. So what it does is it retrieves the incremental log. So all your inserts are put into this log, and the data nodes are the ones reading it. They each have their own channel, and they each read data from that channel. So what it does, it takes that request. So let's say it's an insert this vector. It packs it into a log snapshot. So the way that we store data is we just say, OK, you inserted this vector, inserted this vector, inserted this vector. You compress that, and you save that as a file, and you push it to our storage. And then it also processes all the remutation requests. So if you're deleting, if you're updating, it's the one that pulls up the uh, past data file and then changes it around. Next, we have the index nodes, and those guys are pretty much just in charge of indexing. The other workhorse, indexing is usually the most um, process-heavy uh, part of this whole pipeline. And yeah, those are the ones that need a lot of power. And last, we have the query nodes. And what they do is they just load in the indexes and the raw data and perform searches. So those are the, how pretty much the system functions. Those are the ones that are dealing the most work. And then our storage layer is the last layer. And they are pretty much all comprised of third-party open source software. So the first one is the log broker, which we're using Pulsar. We're planning on using Kafka in the future and kind of having it work with that. It's in charge of all the data streaming and keeping it consistent with the time. Um, the way it works is it's a subscription base. So your workers subscribe to a log, and they just pull the, whenever the pulsar um, pushes a new insert or new change, they read from that log. Um, it also guarantees reliable asynchronous queries, and it provides event notifications. So everyone's kind of listening to pulsar to know if something happens in the system. It's kind of our central backbone to the entire system. Then we have etcd, which I believe is also a uh, Linux Foundation open source project. And we're using that for metadata storage. And in terms of metadata, we are using it as a service registration. Whenever you scale or you start up the system, everyone reports to etcd so that everyone can learn about everything going around. Um, it also is, it, uh, starts up the checks to see if everything's still alive. So it's kind of our heartbeat for the system. And it also creates checkpoints within the entire system, just so if the system crashes, you have recovery points. So it has like a timestamp in the log, and it saves those timestamps so you know if you ever want to come back. And then the last one, I went a little bit over MinIO, but MinIO is our storage. Um, we use MinIO because you can run it as a node in a local system, and it's pretty easy to use. And then it easily transfers to S3, because S3 and MinIO uh, share the same API. And it's used for storing files, 
So the logs, the index files, and also intermediate query results if there are too much to handle on the worker nodes, if there are too many results. So real world use cases, this might be the area that's a little bit more interesting. A uh, quick rundown of our project. I believe as of today, since making these slides, we have over 8,000 commits and 8,000 stars. We have 148 active contributors. We have 24 releases, um, over almost half a million Docker Hub downloads, and over 1,000 users. And we've been going to a lot of meetups and events, so over 100. Um, about the users, so 1,000 enterprise users around the globe. They are in a lot of different areas, because this can apply in a lot of places. They are used, it's used in major banks, online marketplaces, pharmaceutical research companies, real estate agencies, and productivity software companies. This is just naming a few, but I thought these ones were the big ones because they kind of overarch a lot of the technology uh, area. And the common themes that we see with everyone is they have large-scale data sets, usually 10 million uh, entities and above. Their existing solutions are too slow, so they're using relational databases for something you shouldn't really be using a relational database for. And another one is um, that they desire to reduce hardware costs, so saving money is always nice. So the first one I'm going to go over is the smart property search. And this was done by Compass. So it's a major US real estate company. They deal with renting, selling, and buying real estate assets. And they want a better recommendation system because the one that they were using was really slow. And I, they didn't tell us which one, but I think it was just a relational database. And they um, wanted to speed it up for user satisfaction and to get better results. And uh, yeah, they were previously using just traditional um, search engines, which were too slow. And to kind of go over what they did, so what they did is they took all their data. So let's say they had an image of a floor plan, like the exact outlines of the floor plan. They would take that and embed that into vectors. They were using their own neural nets. Um, there was like the area. Um, that one, I'm not sure if they really embedded too much. They had the outline of the house, maybe the direction the house was pointing, um, the location that the house was in, like uh, town-wise. And they would embed all these things into vectors. And then for each one, they would create a collection. And terminology collection is, think of it as a table. And they'd each be a different one because all of these um, features might be different lengths. It could be 512 dimensions or they could be 128. You can't store those in the same one because if there's no, you need at least the same size vector, otherwise there's no way to compare them. And yeah, so they, they had stored them each in their own collection and then they performed a search. So if a user came in, they wanted an area of 500 square meters, they wanted it to be in this location, and they wanted this outline, maybe they draw it in, they, that would all be embedded and um, turned into vectors. And then ultimately, after searching, you'd get the results from every collection, and since they're all distances, you could, they had their own ranking algorithm. If someone was more interested in the area compared to the size, you could weight that result higher and when you're combining everything. And that's sort of the system that they made. Um, it took only six months from the idea to being all the way in production, and they saw higher customer satisfaction, which ultimately means that they were making more money, it seems. And for future work, they had a cool few, few ideas. So um, since they're already dealing with unstructured data, the idea was that they could use pictures, videos, voices, and text. So one idea was, like, let's say you have a nice view. You can take a photo of the view, and you can embed that into a vector. If someone's looking for a house with a view of the ocean, you could have that in the system, and then you could find similar results for that. Or if you wanted mountains in the distance, or if you wanted some type of view that you were looking for, you could insert that. Or if like, you have the surrounding sound noise, if it's loud, then you can see, and then you can kind of find similar results. And they are also working on an AI chatbot, which doesn't really have to do with smart property search, but it's another use case of Milvis and vector similarity search. And the next one is product recommendation. This was done by Tokopedia, which is the largest e-commerce platform in Indonesia. Um, so what they were doing, they were previously using Elasticsearch for all their search recommendations. And the way they were using it was raw keyword counts, which nowadays it's not really as good because we've gone a long way with semantic word embeddings. And what this means, for those of you who are not familiar, semantic word embeddings are a way of taking your words and grouping words that are similar but not like exactly the same into a similar category to have similar vector values. So think of it as a th thesaurus. Um, the thesaurus, uh, you search for a word and it has similar words that mean the same thing but they are spelled completely differently. And that's what they wanted to do. Um, so what they did was they took their products, their uh, descriptions, categories, labels, they converted them all to embeddings using word to vec which I believe is one of the more popular word embedding um, uh, encoders, 
and they threw it into Milvis, and then when someone came in wanting to search for some item, uh, they would just throw it in, it would get embedded into a vector, and they would search for it, and you would get the best results uh, based on the semantics of the word and not just the keyword count. So it wasn't just counting how many times you said car in the description. And um, the results were pretty great. So they had a 10 times improvement in query performance, a 90% reduction in hardware costs, and a 10 times accuracy improvement in search accuracy. And future work, since they're already almost there with embeddings, it's probably personalized advertising for them. Uh, the next one is in a little bit of a different area. It's pharmaceutical molecular analysis. This was done by a leading international pharmaceutical company. And what they were doing is they were researching how drugs interact, and they were trying to find certain interactions. And they had a data set of 800 million molecules. And let's say they have a new molecule and they wanted to see if it works in a certain reaction. It would be kind of hard to test that reaction, or it might be expensive to test that reaction. So what they wanted to do was first check if there's a similar molecule that they've already done that test and see if it works. If it works, that kind of gives them a reason to test it because there's a higher chance it would work. And if not, they'd be pretty confident that this might not be the solution so they could skip over it, ultimately saving a lot of time. So in their previous use, they were using a Spark cluster and it took around 10 minutes to search through 800 million molecules using 30 nodes. And what you can pretty much assume from this is it was just a brute force search and nobody ever wants that. So they decided to use Milvis, and the way they did this is you would take your molecular formula, so every molecule could kind of be described in um, a standardized way of kind of writing out the molecule, and there's this uh, package called RDKit, and RDKit is a chemical analysis package. I think you have to install it using Conda, and it's pretty cool that it transforms these molecular finger, uh, formulas into binary fingerprints, so binary vectors. And luckily, we support binary vectors. So what they did is they threw them into Milvis. And when dealing with molecules, you kind of use the tiny mode of similarity. So in the previous examples, I already talked about like how there's Euclidean distance, there's cosine similarity. Tiny mode is another one. It's equivalent to the Jacquard distance in, um, when you're using it on binary uh, values. And that's what they ended up using. And it worked pretty well. So you'd perform a search, and it would show you what the closest results were. It had a 1,200 times speed up, so it went from 10 minutes to half a second. And this was done on one node, so they could reduce a lot of the hardware costs. Um, and for future work, they want to work on a pharmacological analysis. And pharmacological analysis is studying how a chemical or drug interacts with organs and like your human system. And another one is they want uh, molecular activity predictions which is just instead of having to test the molecule, can they predict what's going to happen? And they were thinking that they could use Milvis in those use cases. Um, second to last is probably the most popular thing in terms of similarity search. I think everyone knows about this one, and it's reverse image search. So Google has something similar where you can plug in a photo, and you can search it and find photos that are similar. And the background for this one, it was the Cleveland Museum of Art. They wanted to kind of put more technology into their exhibits. I thought it was pretty cool. And I didn't know it's one of the largest museums in the United States. I believe it's the second largest. And yeah, they were combining technology and art to kind of increase people's interest. So they're doing a lot of things with virtual reality. And they have exhibits where you can go with the virtual reality headsets and walk around. And what they did with Milvis is they kind of wanted like physical interaction. So ultimately what they were doing is they were creating a art search engine. So in person, you could strike poses right next to like a figure, and let's say it was a sculpture, and you could tell how similar your pose is to that sculpture. So this was something that they did in person. And then online, they put a reverse image search for their entire art collection, the ones that they could legally, um, were allowed to kind of post online in terms of infringing any rules for art. But so for this example, I kind of pulled up the site and I threw in the Golden Gate, and what it gave back was a sketch of a bridge, I think, in uh, New York. But this is the system that they were making, and this is a pretty common pipeline for this type of thing. The way it works is you take your photo, you throw it. In our case, we recommend people to use two neural nets. The first one is a YOLO net, and what YOLO net's really good at is pulling out objects from images. So let's say you have a video stream, and you want to get all the images of the bikes out of it. This is what YOLO net's good for, because it gives you a bounding box for everything inside the image. So what you do is you throw your original image through YoloNet, it pulls out all the key feet, like key images in there, or things that are areas of interest, and you throw that through ResNet for the actual embedding. And for ResNet, 
And a lot of these models, what you have to do is they're usually trained on classification. And with classification, the last layer, you lose all your data. Because the last layer, you're just combining it all to see if it's a dog or if it's a cat or if it's like some bound object. With the layer before that, that's where you have your embeddings and that's where all the data is stored. So you take off the last layer of ResNet and that's how you get your embedding. You put that into Milvis and then similar pipeline. You throw what you're searching for through those neural nets and you can search for it and give the closest result. The last one, uh, as you guys can also see, it's a very similar process for incorporating this. It's always take your data, encode it, put it into Milvis. But this one was for Huawei. They were working on a music recommendation engine for their phone app. And yeah, so they didn't have any use case before, but they needed something that was fast and could deal with multi-million uh, scale data. And what they ended up doing was using Milvis. So it's currently in pre-production, but the way they did it and the way you mainly work with music is you first take the music you're working with that you want to insert, and you have to separate it to the background music and the vocals. And this is usually done with things such as audio inversion. And what this is important, this is important because with vocals, you can, your neural net might catch on to the sound of the voice or it might sound, catch on to what the person is singing. You don't really know with vocals. And it, that's an issue because you have a lot of cover songs. So using the vocals is usually not a good one to find similar songs. Background music is more um, unique to the song and it's a lot easier for the system, I believe, to understand. But with neural nets, you never know, it's a black box. So they got the best results by using the background music. They were using a, a convolutional neural net. There's a lot of other different networks nowadays, but I think it was a one-dimensional neural net. And from that, you could get your embeddings out of the, or the vector embeddings out of the audio. Throw that into the Milvis, and then you could perform the same thing again. You search for a song that you listen to, and then you could find similar results. The interesting thing about this is with um, music recommendation, you probably don't want the same exact song. You want something that's similar, but a bit different because if you just return the list of the most similar songs, it's probably gonna be the same exact beat because a lot of songs share beats. So what they were doing is that they would, uh, let's say they looked for the 70 closest results and they would reverse that list because you want something that's similar but not exactly the same. And that's, where, that's what they decided to do. And these are pretty much the use cases I wanted to go over because it kind of goes into every field. It's audio, vision, um, text, uh, pharmaceutical, it just covers all the bases. But there are a lot of people using different setups of the systems, doing different pipelines, and uh, they're doing really cool stuff. So yeah, that's my presentation. Um, here are some resources. Uh, we have our webpage, we have our GitHub, Twitter, and then our Medium blog. And we're also participating in Hacktoberfest, which is like a cool program to get people more involved with open source, and it promotes new users to kind of work on easy issues and we're offering some cool rewards if anyone's interested in that. And yeah, if uh, anyone has any questions, there might be a few, but uh, let me know. Sure. Yeah, so it's up to the user. So if you're running it in S3, you upload, pretty much store all your data in S3. You can run a min.io node in the cluster and give it its own storage, but if you're on S3, it's just worth it. You can just replace it because the entire syntax is the same. You kind of just get rid of the node and you just put the S3 address instead in Helm. And that's how you kind of get around that. So we're working on SSL support. Um, it's one of the things also for our SDKs. We used to have it in 1.0, but we're kind of adapting it for 2.0 because we had some issues. That's on the docket. It's the whole pro 2.0, like the one that's mainly cloud oriented, is still in release candidates. So. We're fixing up some bugs and working on what features to improve and what to implement. Sure. So the main points is um, the actual indexing. Not a, none of these places really support indexing. There is multi-column indexing but that won't work the same way because it'll first have to find one that fits the first row and then the second row, and since the first row might not be similar, but all the other ones, like, in terms of vectors, the first um, space might not be similar, so in a multi-column index, I believe at least, if you don't catch the first, you'll avoid the rest. So that's where a big problem comes in, and like Elasticsearch is trying to solve that. They're doing some um, dense vector indexing. I think they're limited to vectors of size 20, 48. But that's where the big problem with these old databases is, is that you result to uh, pretty much just brute force searches across the data. And that's never good if you're dealing with multi-million data sets.
Any other questions? Um, I guess not. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining me on this. It's a little bit short, but uh, I think I got most of the info. Have a good one.